Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our conversation. This is sponsored this evening by the Society of Professional Journalists, New England chapter and the Boston Association of Black Journalists. My name is Kristen Pope. I am, have the privilege of being an award-winning journalist. I'm a former anchor and television reporter, most recently for NBC Boston. And I have the privilege and the pleasure of being joined by two phenomenal columnists, Michelle Singletary of the Washington Post and Janae Osterhelt of the Boston Globe. Thank you, ladies. Thank you for being with us this evening to have this conversation. Thanks. Glad to be here. So before we jump in, um, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself and I'm, and I'm doing it from the way I'm looking at you. So Michelle, if you would go first and then Janae, if you would introduce yourself to our audience next. Sure, that's great. Well, as you say, I'm a, the uh, personal finance columnist for the Washington Post. My column is syndicated across the country, including in the Boston Globe up there, uh, which I'm so excited about. They've been a client for a long time and hope a long time more. Um, let's see, what else do I can tell you? <laughs> I'm the mother of three 20-year-olds. I've been writing about personal finance for a long time. I guess the other only thing is I have a new book coming out um, in May, uh, What to Do With Your Money When Crisis Hits. Mm -hmm. And it was really inspired by all the financial issues that people are having because of the pandemic. Uh, and so it's a FAQ type book that just sort of and, uh, soup the nuts. What, what can you do um, when there is recession or economic downturn? Because this too shall pass, but we're going to be in another financial crisis at some point. And so it's good to try to get your money together um, now for the next crisis. Thank you for always answering our personal finance questions. <laughs> Thank you for always keeping us on point. Yeah. That book sounds like an answer. Um, Janae? I'm trying to get that book so I can keep my coin properly collected. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Janae Osterhell, Boston Globe culture columnist and resident troublemaker. I uh, cover identity and social justice through the lens of culture and the arts. And I'm also the creator of A Beautiful Resistance centering Black joy and Black life. And I'm so happy to be here. Fantastic. Ladies, thank you so much. This conversation um, in the midst of Black History Month um, is beautiful. Janae, I've been listening to so much of your, your work and about how beautiful we are as people. I mean, it's something that I relish in as a fellow HBCUer. I yes. relish in our Black beauty and our Black identity. And you, um, you story it so well in your column, The Black Resistance, and in the work that you do. Ladies, we want to talk, we want to kick it off and talk about how these columns, how they came to be in your newsroom, why they're important, how they shine a light on Black life, Black disparity, why they're necessary. That was like 10 questions in one. So I'm going to start from the beginning. I'm going to start over. <laughs> so we'll start with you, Janae. How did the Black resistance happen and in um, your newsroom specifically? So a beautiful resistance is a kind of a natural outgrowth of my culture column. Um, I've been a culture columnist for many years, so I've, I've always centered Black life and identity and social justice. But often I, I'm writing about, you know, racism and injustice and inequity. And uh, I went to Minneapolis when George Floyd was lynched and I went for his funeral. And being there, especially at that point in the pandemic, um, it was just so much trauma on top of trauma. And I was thinking about how I had literally covered pretty much the entire, from the from the beginning of the Black Lives Matter movement, all like I've just for years now, it's, it's like been dominating my writing. And if you hear a sound that is Peppermint Patty, my dog, her resistance is many things, beautiful is not one. <laughs> um, so, I got back from Minneapolis and I just needed, you know, I, I'm single, I live alone. I needed a, a way to, to wrap my arms around us. You know, we can't touch anybody right now. We can't hug, we can't do the things that we as people normally do. Mm -hmm. And I thought a lot about um, 
you know, old black ma mantras and things that we say, like, um, you know, after the laughter comes in the pain, joy and pain, um, the beautiful struggle. And then I started thinking about Ossie Davis and that quote he had that was like, I find in being black, a thing of beauty, a joy, a strength, a secret cup of gladness. And it's just, it just kind of came to me quite spiritually, a beautiful resistance. I want to center our beauty, our joy. I want to celebrate black life as it's lived, not bodies and hashtags. Um, as journalists, it's important we get the story right. And we spend a lot of time covering one aspect of the black experience. And we cannot be measured by our, our burden and our pain and our brutality. Like we have to get the full picture. You got to stop. <laughs> Listen. Peppermint Patty feels as strongly as you do about this <laughs> today. <laughs> like a dog, amen. Ago, um, but basically, I just went to my editor and said, look, I need something. I need something else. I need to be able to focus my voice in a different kind of way. And I was like, I will still write throughout the summer the same kind of columns I've always written, but I also need this multimedia series where we can do video, we could do playlists, we could do Q&A. Like, it's literally... I called them mixtapes. So it was six mm -hmm. episodes, but every episode was a mixtape. It was a short film, a written story, a Q and A and a playlist. And then every day, kind of like humans of New York, every day we have a person of color or a black person sharing their beautiful resistance on Instagram. But I'm gonna tip it over to Michelle because <laughs> I think it's all about sincerely <laughs> Michelle and I want Peppermint Patty to hush. <laughs> well, and, okay. and <laughs> and as we go into, you know, sincerely, Michelle, yeah, as we go into, you know, Janae, it's so your column, the, the, the project, I will say that the project is so powerful because, you know, as journalists, we know that especially if you are one of only in a newsroom, if you're not there, these stories mm -hmm. never get told. Mm -hmm. You know, I've heard you say it too often. We don't are the the beauty of us, the humanity of us, the fullness of us doesn't make it above the fold because our newsrooms are so used to depicting us one way and, and not in the fullness of who we are. Mm -hmm. So um, the beautiful resistance is such a, it's just so necessary. Mm -hmm. So tipping into Sincerely Michelle, talk to us about how this, and, and, and you as well, Michelle, you've been a columnist for many years. How did this addition happen? Yeah, so um, just FYI, I put a link um, to the series. That's the first one. It was a 10-part series. Really, it's le uh, like 12 parts, but the main columns are 10. Um, a link to that. Um, and much like Renee said, I, you know, as a personal finance columnist, I wasn't involved in a lot of the reporting of Joy Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and all that kind of, and all the protests. And, you know, we're sort of trained as journalists to be objective. And so I'm writing about personal finance, doing all my business. And it just, it just hit me that I wanted to be a part of this discussion in a way that I've never been. People know me about money, but there's so much has happened to me in my long career. And I went to my editor. It's interesting you should say how you went to your editor. And um, I said, listen, I want to write a, some columns about being Black in America and, and focus on race and money. And I don't even think I finished my sentence before this woman was like in, <laughs> she just took off and, 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 and they hired an illustrator and got the post reports of all the podcasts. And I mean, it was a whirlwind. And I was thinking I'd write just a couple. And she's like, no, we're going to do 10. I'm like, woman, is you crazy? I'm writing 10 columns about race and money. They're going to run me out of this town. Because, you know, quite frankly, people don't want to hear about this. Um, they, they, they feel like they're on overload. And in fact, I wrote a column about some of the reader feedback um, at the end. And it was just like, it's just too much. And I'm thinking, it's too much for you? And this is just 10 columns? Imagine what it's like to live that. And so the first column about my experience um, coming to the post, um, and it was, it, it was hard at first. You know, when you get to a purse like the Boston Globe or the Post or NBC, 
Um, there are a lot of people who think you got there just simply because you're black. Michelle, tell that story. Please tell that story because I've heard you tell it a couple of times. I need you to tell that story because so many of us have that story or a story like it. Go ahead and tell it. Yeah, whenever you get to a place, especially one of these premier brands like Ivy League type, either employment or college, people look at you like, yo, you just got here because you're black. And so there were whispers about it. And they ask you questions like, well, what's your background? Or, you know, they ask you these probing questions that really isn't like, I want to get to know you. It's more like, well, how did you get here? And I got at the post at a fairly young age, about 29 in the business section, one of only three um, in the business section, two reporters and economists. And um, there's just all these questions. And I had some friends in the section be like, yeah, people are asking about you. And I, and I, and it just, it was relentless. Uh, and I finally went to my editor, um, uh, David Weiss, and we were coming out of a staff meeting and I was just all kind of funky. And I said, listen, I pulled him to the side and I did the one, I just asked him really bluntly, did you hire me because I was black? Just, and he just, without me, to, without missing a beat, he said, I did. <laughs> I remember like it was yesterday, I, I just felt this like weight drop on me. Like, did he really just say he really did hire me just because I was black? And I, I started to tear up and he said, come into my office and let's sit down and talk about this. And in my head, I was thinking, so all these white folks, are tr they write, they just hired me because I'm, you know, they pull some black head off the street. And he then proceeded to say, I hired you because you were black, but I also hired you because you're a woman. I hired you because I was getting a master's degree in business from Johns Hopkins at the time. I had an expertise in bankruptcy coverage, which is actually how he found me. Um, he said, I hired you because you're a good reporter. I hired you because you came from a low income background. And so as you're reporting on personal finance, you have, you understand where the readers are coming from. You know, you don't come from money. And he just did a whole list of why he hired me. And then I, in my head, I'm thinking, well, why you ain't stop with all of that? He said, because I want to. Uh oh, Michelle, we're losing you. We're losing your audio. Okay. There you are. Okay. Um, he said, I want, he said, he didn't stop with all of that because he said he didn't want me to think my blackness was not an asset. He said, you're an asset because you're black. And I wanted to start there because I never want you to feel as if you can't say that you are a black columnist. And that just blew me away that he was so sensitive to say, you know, what your experience as a black person, that's, that's, why, that's why you are here. Don't let anybody ever question that. And I just, to this day, I'm so grateful that he said that to me because I was feeling like somehow I was an imposter. You know, I had the imposter syndrome. And so that's why I, that the first column is about when you're the quote unquote, or seen as the quote unquote affirmative action, you're always trying to justify your existence. Um, and it's a, it's a heavy, heavy burden. That's not to say that you shouldn't have affirmative action, but recognize that there's a price to pay when you are seen as the black hire, that you continually have to justify yourself. And I've been at the post for a very long time, almost 30 years next year, and I'm still feeling that after all of this time. Uh, and there are people who work in my newsroom who I know said things about me that I have to work alongside still. Uh, and you can't imagine what that feels like. And here we are in these quote unquote liberal bastions of, you know, people, you know, especially administration talking about us. And we know quite well that even some of the people that we work with harbor some of these views. Um, and so, and as the series went along, we, you know, I addressed redlining and um, this whole notion that black people don't have no money because they spend money on $200 sneakers. And, you know, even if some of the stuff that we say to ourselves, I, can, I think it's not a single financial forum that I went to that is almost black, 100% black, where someone doesn't say, well, you know, black people don't, and, you know, and I'm like, no, I don't know, because I actually see the studies and I actually interview a whole bunch of people and white people don't know nothing about their money, just like anybody else. <laughs> you know, America. And that, 
And you know what? And so this is this pivots into my next question. I just want to let our attendees know that you can ask questions in the chat box in the Q&A area. Please feel free to ask Michelle and Janae questions as we're having this conversation. And so to that, Michelle, and I want I want you to hold on to that thought because I, I, I want to go there. Janae, you know, Michelle is getting ready to talk about basically the fullness of who we are, like having her having that background. How important is it? I mean, well, one, the first, my first question is, you know, having a column, a black person having a culture column, having that at the Boston Globe, how important is that to cover the full span? You get to cover the full expanse of the black experience. How important is that? I'm gonna answer your question, but I wanna add on to what Michelle was saying, because I have been a black columnist covering race for a really, I've been a journalist for 18 years and I've been a columnist for more of them than not. Um, I became a columnist really young. I was a nightlife columnist first and then I became a culture columnist around the age of like 28, 29. Um, and I've been covering racism probably for almost 12 of those years. And right out the gate, even as an intern, I was threatened, I was called the N-word, called a bitch, called, I mean, just like every type of slur, even slurs that are not black slurs, like Latinx slurs, Asian slur for the people who just couldn't figure out which one to call me. Um, I was dragged by alternative publications, like editors who were 30 and 40 years my senior using their their editor spot in the letter to the readers to talk about how I was an affirmative action hire and why would the star make someone like me a columnist? So those are things that I deal with all of the time. I've just had my life threatened a couple months ago, right before Thanksgiving. So it's, it's like a constant um, experience. Like when you are black in a newsroom, especially if you have a column and you talk about race in any way, there is an anger. It's not just that people don't want to hear it and they're tired of hearing it. They want to shut you up. Yeah. And on top of that, there's people in your own newsroom that will begrudge you and um, have feelings about you or you're too loud or you're too every, you know, you, you know, you make everything about race. Maybe you should write about other things. Um, so I just wanted to, to kind of at least tack onto that. I have been <laughs> asked, am I the intern? I have been um, checked by security. Like, do you, you know, can I help you? Like, I don't work there. You know, I've had so many experiences in this industry that are just highly racist and inappropriate um, as far as the importance. And so um, it's that constant questioning of no, it's the, it's that constant it's like questioning. What Michelle said, like all these years later, as esteemed as she is, is something that's still in her head because we never like, we never quite, no matter, I just feel like no matter how accomplished you get, no matter how much good work you do, and even when you're nice to people, even when you, you, you know, you're the person in the office that like brings treats and there's still that inherent mm -hmm. unconscious bias and sometimes in your face bias. I mean, it's just there. It's always, you're always having to deal with it and you're always grappling with the, is this the fight that I'm going to fight today? Because there's so many micro, I, I was telling someone one time, it's like being covered in mosquito bites all the time yeah. and trying to decide, am I going to scratch today or am I, am I going to just like ignore this? Yeah. You um, started to say, Janae, uh, microaggressions. And one of my columns was about that. And, you know, when you try to write about this stuff, people think you're oversensitive or you're overreacting. Or you're lying. Or, or you're lying. <laughs> right. Like, like they didn't mean that. They absolutely did mean that. Or you're lying. Um, and, and so you oftentimes don't talk about it or you, you even in your own head, well, maybe. And I, and I guess that's one of the reasons why I want to write this series. I am tired of making excuses for people um, and even just not addressing it in the moment. Um, and as I did that column, I was talking to a professor um, uh, at Columbia who talked about how we have, to, we have to address them in the moment because they just won't stop unless we do. You don't have to be aggressive. You don't have to be nasty, but you do need to address it. Mm -hmm. um, Sometimes you do need to be nasty. Like I, I mostly try to respectfully read people, 
but every now it don't always work out that but way. But every now and then, I'm like, wait a minute. I'm from Virginia. Let's have a talk. But, well, because um, you know what? Some people don't always respond to that, if we're honest. Some people don't always respond well, to the nice cities. About jur- other journalists. Like, yeah. Especially when we're talking about the stuff that's in the news. Like, I'm not even talking about. You do have to, um, I, a lot of times there are certain people, particularly older white men that I think will try to push as far as they can push because they've been getting away with it for so long. Yeah, and they honestly think that they are um, in extinction. Um, one of the, my colleagues who I actually really respect and actually liked um, said to me early in my career, his desk was right across from mine and we both would get there early in the morning. He'd get there to do stock trades and I'd just get there because, you know, I'm trying not to be the Black person who's late. So, and he um, was talking about all, the, at that time they were, um, they had a lot of minority hires, including myself. And he was saying, yeah, it's going to be a point where, you know, we're going to be extinct in the newsroom or something to that extent. And I, I, and then by that time, people had started to come in and I'm looking around and it's like mostly white. So I did say, I said, won't you stand up and look around? I don't see no shortage of white. somebody else is going to be diminished this is not, you know if you're a parent of kids and you're giving them they're always like well your slice is bigger than mine but you won't get some power honey you know and well and you need to say, say that and to your point you know michelle i think what we continuously find is the majority or white people feeling fearful that power is being taken or that somehow they're being edged out when that is as false as it can possibly be. And so to that point, you know, what has to change? We know, we know, I'm not going to ask the question about necessarily about how important is it for us to be in front of and behind the camera. It is, it is paramount. Our stories won't get told. Our representation will not happen. We need to be representative of the full humanity. But what has to change ultimately in our newsroom? Um, go ahead, Janae. It's not enough. I ain't gonna lie. I was just scratching my brace. Okay. It's, it's not enough. It's not enough to hire um, black people to hire brown people to hire Asian people to hire LGBT plus people to hire immigrant people. It's not enough to to hire inclusively. Like that is important. It's absolutely important that we have that representation. That we have that seat at the table, both at the masthead and you know interns, co-ops, writers editors across the board we need uh inclusion is an action item Mm -hmm. but if you hire black and brown people you hire people of color oppressed peoples and bring them in and your system is still the same not a lot is going to change there's lots of black journalists who have left the business black journalists who are exhausted of the business who were brought to the table but they were still in a broken system, kind of like we made Obama president, but he was president of a supremacist system. So it's Mm -hmm. like only so much can change if the framework doesn't change. So some of this is like, what kind of training are these uh, publishers and managing editors getting? Like what kind of reframing and how is their brain working? How are we talking about, photo editors and the pictures we use and who makes it above the fold and the real estate you get. Michelle and I are columnists. We had the way we both were like, we went to our editors. That's a luxury and a privilege of a columnist, a respected columnist who can say, this is how I want to use my real estate. And their editor will say, all right, not everybody has that privilege. That's not something every reporter could just feel comfortable doing. That's something that a certain amount of, of uh, freedom and access that comes with like ha- being able to opine on whatever your expertise or, or beat is. You're right, you're absolutely and, right. That's such a great point. 
um, of, um, Janae, that it, you know, you do get to a point where you can make certain demands, but you're right. It, it, we have to um, have more training and management training. I mean, think about it really in most newsrooms, people have not had any actual management training. Somebody was a good reporter, they made them an editor. That does not necessarily mean that they're a good editor. And, and quite frankly, just, and making black people editors does not necessarily mean you're going to get um, a, a good black editor who will look out for stuff that just, absolutely you know you got to be careful about that as well um and so you know we I, I still can't believe it's 2020 and we are still having this conversation in our newsroom but it still has to be had and things still need had to be still need to be changed because we're talking about the full gamut of things I mean we're talking about what you're able to report on what you look like I can remember a news manager, I, one day I came in not to report, but to do some producing. And I, because I wasn't gonna be on air, I wore my hair in its natural texture. And he looked at me and he said, you're not gonna wear your hair on air like that. And I knew he wasn't asking me, I knew mm -hmm. he was telling me. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're still dealing with, you know, can I, can I be myself? Can I look like myself? Do I mm -hmm. not have to assimilate to a certain appearance in order for me to be, you know, present my work on air. So, mm -hmm. you know, with that being said, how would one, to get that kind of power that you spoke about, Janae, Michelle, how does one become a columnist? Oh, well. Because <laughs> I know somebody is thinking, and actually I see um, the question down here, you know, how do you, how do you, if you wanted to become a columnist or have your own series, how would you do something like that in a newsroom? Well, you know, um, there isn't sort of a laid out blueprint for becoming a columnist. Um, I will say this, that when you develop an expertise in your beat or area, and so much so that you can write opinion about it, that is how you get on the track to have a columnist. And oftentimes you've got to make that room for yourself. I mean, I, I'm I wouldn't say I'm an accidental columnist. I never had a desire to become a columnist, quite frankly. Um, I just was, you know, chief in the newsroom and sharing stories about my grandmother. And, and my editor was like, you know, you ought to write a column about some of this craziness you write, you tell them about. Because they would all go out to lunch, for example, and I'd be fighting them. I'm not going out to lunch with y'all. Y'all spend way too much money. And I just was, you know, telling them. And he said, well, you should just write about your grandmother. And from that, People were just like a regular person writing about money in the business section. I can understand. Uh, and then I was still beat reporting while I was doing the column kind of like on the side. And then eventually I told my editor, I can't do both. I can't be an objective reporter, an unbiased reporter and write this column. And I, I would rather do the column and I was really good at it. So they just switched me over. And, but even then at the beginning, there were lots of, you know, the microaggressions is just like no joke. They would say, well, your column's just so simple, uh -huh. you know, and, you know, you should write about this. And I'm like, well, you should get your own column and write. That's, you. that's right. <laughs> you get your column, you can tell me what to write. My story is a lot like Michelle. Oh, mm. I just, I chose my choice. Uh oh, Michelle, come a little bit closer, Michelle, because we're losing you. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to make sure my uh, thing is in there. Yeah, okay. okay. Is that better? That's better. Is it just the sound that you're losing? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, maybe I pushed the computer back too far. So, um, so how do you, I just think you, with anything with success, I, I sort of feel like the most successful people are successful because they're doing something that they love and they became good at. You don't sort of wake up, I'm going to be a columnist. You just become good at what you are. If you write about, you know, the auto industry and you then become like an own expert and you can almost repeat what the experts say, then you are a good candidate to be a columnist. I will say this, people sort of hear columns and think, oh, that's such a good job. But let me just tell you, that is a grinding job. Very column good. in, column out every week. Everyone yeah. thinks it's easy. Everybody, Everybody thinks it's easy. But it's like easy. anyone can do that. Anyone can do that. And I'm like, okay. you are so 
so disrespectful. Hush your mouth. And so right. see, they're saying that you guys should write a book about this because if there's no blueprint, we need y'all to give us the blueprint. Somebody there needs isn't them. a blueprint though. They're really it. Like I saw that comment and I appreciate it, but my story is very similar to Michelle's. Like I am an accidental columnist. Like I like again, like I started when I was like 22, 23, and after a series of internships. And I was like most young journalists, they try to get you to do 10 jobs. So it's like, mm -hmm. I was I was a music critic first and foremost, cause that was my passion was hip hop. So I was a music critic. I was covering all the concerts, reviewing the concerts. That was kind of my expertise at that time. Um, and then I was also covering pop culture when the fashion critic was on vacation or away. She designated me the fill in because she didn't think anyone until she had seen me, no one there had fashion to her. So. <laughs> So she, she kind of reeled me in on that. So, I mean, I literally was doing multiple things and they wanted a nightlife columnist. And because features in journalism is such a, um, you know, now it's a little easier, but it, back then I was when you had to work X amount of years in Metro and right. I went straight into features. So right. people were already pissed that a young black girl was just right. in features right away. Mm -hmm. But because I was in features, they were like, oh my God, a young person, we can actually do that nightlife column because we, we didn't have a young person. So I was doing all those things and a nightlife column. That nightlife column grew with me. So, you know, initially I was going to clubs, going to bars, reviewing happy hours, saying this is where you should go on a date. But that became very big and very well read. And I, as I got older, as we do, <laughs> how you move changes. So I would be at clubs and experience racism, sexism, um, all types of craziness. And I would write about it. So it went from, it was still like, you can go to this place, but it, it heavy topics started making their way in yeah. and then when I would cover music and in profiles my voice my column voice would leak in to my reportage and the managing editor at the time called me in his office and he said look we think you should be a columnist like a an anchor columnist you should you know straight up cover lifestyle and culture that's 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 where you're going that's what we would like to groom you into and then they were like, oh, let's just write three columns, practice columns, see mm -hmm. how it goes. I was super scared, flying by the seat of my pants on fire. I wrote three practice columns that I thought was just for editors to see, and they published them and just pushed me out the window. Wow. Um, so I really do think Michelle is right. It's not like, I think some of the columnists that people probably like, like I, I highly doubt Leonard Pitts was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a old professor. I, right. You know, like, I think it's something that people see in you and it's a natural outgrowth of either an expertise, a voice, a personality, an authority, a, an ability to contextualize. So all of what Michelle said is true. Like if you have an expertise, hone it. If you have a passion, hone it. Get to know yourself and your voice and hone that. Um, but and one thing you keep saying that I think, um, is so key is your voice. I didn't quite get that when I first started the column. Um, and one of my editors was like, oh, you, you know, you, you have a, a, a unique voice and, and he was a white guy. And I was just like, you know, I'm a Baptist. I'm thinking like, you know, you talking about spirits and stuff. What are you talking about? <laughs> but, but, but if you read a certain column as you do, and took the box, take the byline off you would still know who that, for the most part, you could tell yeah, who that right. columnist is. You can hear them talking to you. Right, just like music, right? You know Jennifer, you know, has some song. When she sing, you know, when Aretha, if you didn't know that was her song, that, you know, on the on the billboard or whatever, you'd know it was her. It's the same thing with a columnist. You've got to have a unique voice mm -hmm. um, and be bold about it too. Um, I, I just have, you know, especially since I'm writing about, you know, money and technical stuff, it's like, I'm not, a, I'm not a black and I'm not a gray kind of columnist. I'm like, don't do that. Period. <laughs> I'm not are not like that. Well, it depends. And maybe you should do that. I'm like, no, don't send your kids to that school. No. So, you know, that's kind of the voice. So you find your own voice and you will find your path. And being comfortable in that, because one of the things you said, Michelle, and, 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 you know, to your point to Janae is, you know, honing your voice, it's, it's easier to hone your voice when you know what you're talking about. 
That is true. That is true. You know, you can be confident in what you know. So if you studied and if you have, like you said, perfected that craft, you know what you're talking about. So I can get up here and talk about, you know, being a mom of a toddler because I do that every right. day. You know what I mean? Or I can get up here and talk about, you know, helping young people, aspiring journalists become, uh, you know, get into the newsroom because that's something that I do. And so being able to know for certain, this is what I know and studying that thing um, helps you become more confident in your voice. Right. Another right. question that we have is about the Trump era. <laughs> I don't even want to give that room here, but we're going to do it. <sighs> And, you know, for some people, some people were actually nervous about the election going to Biden because of how much work and how much they were able to talk about 45. How do you feel, one way or the other, has there been mistrust in talking about racial issues because of 45, because of that era? How has that played into, you know, your columns and just what it is that you what it is that you write about racially? Well, I had to cover the whole thing because that's, I cover identity and social justice. So I, I was writing about it from the campaign on to the whole, I wrote about the terrorist attack in the Capitol, the election, everything. Um, one thing I want to say is like, he is not the cause, he's the effect. Right. So it's right. like, one, that distrust was always there Mm -hmm. He definitely amplified it, uh, manipulated it, made it way worse, but mm -hmm. it was always there, particularly for journalism having to do with race and racism, mm -hmm. like, because America does not want to admit who it is. Like even Biden himself, the one thing he says that annoys me all the time is this is not who we are. America, yeah. 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 I hate when he I'm says just this like, too. this is who we are. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Exactly who we are. We are in a, in many ways. All Trump did is take the mask off. That's right, and, and, and reveal the real face. I think, um, you know, Dubois talked about the double consciousness and the veil. We aren't black people. Aren't the only people in the veil? Like America has its own veil and its own double consciousness. Like the 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 utopia and superpower it thinks it it is in the mm -hmm. actual shithole that it really is and mm. it's it's the uh for me there were the distrust around writers who write about racism existed before him my life got threatened before him I, I was being treated terribly before him by readers but the, the difference is he validated the the distrust he he gave so much credit to the distrust the, the fake news, the, and it's scary because Biden, one election can't fix that. Mm -hmm. One presidency can't fix that. That's like real framework, real culture work, real uh, social sciences that has to be done on the American psyche. Mm -hmm. Particularly we've lost what, we've lost the art of critical thinking. Mm. And, um, and so when I think about journalism and where we stand because of him, because of 45, it's like working to win the trust back of the American people mm -hmm. is going to be a long, hard road. And part of it is us. I mean, we can only do so much, but what we can do is a good and thorough job, a full job um, of being accurate, of being true. And we're not perfect. Like none of us have perfected it. Even if you're an expert in what you've done, none of us have like, that just doesn't exist. So it's like, when you're wrong, when you make a mistake, be wrong and make a mistake, be accountable. Um, accountability is a love language. So, I mean, that's kind of, I, 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 I want to hear what Michelle has to say, but that's kind of what I'm thinking. No, I, you know, ditto to everything that you said. I mean, we like to sort of try to think that it was just Trump, but I love your analogy that he, especially as apropos, since he didn't ever like to wear a mask, he mm -hmm. just let people take their mask off. See, that's the thing. And here's the thing. It wasn't just, we focus on the proud voice of the KKK, but that's not who took their mask off. Because mm -mm. we already know they crazy. We already yeah. know they don't like us. And I actually prefer them because you know where they coming from. You know where they stand. You know where they stand. And I'm sure this is happens with you, a column. When I wrote those 10 columns, what shocked, not shocked me, but what dismayed me 
was the uh, the the uh, racist um, craziness that came from people in jobs and positions that you'd be like, what? MIT professor basically calling me an N-word, right? You know, people who are managerial positions. I actually got an email from some white guy who says he does diversity training. And some of the stuff he said in the email to me, I'm thinking, who hires you to talk about diversity? You just the most racist email I have ever seen. Okay, 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 person wrote this email. I got racist emails from deacons at churches that sign like they position with their church yes. under their signature. I'm just like. And so those folks were in hiding, right? Now, not hiding from us because we know they were there, yeah. but they were given permission to say things that they would not normally say. So then out there. I mean, think about some of the people who were arrested. You know, um, think about the Karens that we saw, you know, and, and, and the reason why that's important is because they are in uh, mid-level. They're not the kind of people that you would even identify, but that, that like the, the woman from New York who worked for an insurance company in a middle management position or higher middle management position. So she's in a position where she can hire and fire people. And she had this sort of viewpoint that was exposed when she was out with just her dog. So that's what you are contending with. So Trump, and it that didn't stop Trump, but actually, you know, obviously America has been racist forever, but uh, really with Reagan, uh, Reagan basically said, it's okay, them black people already got what they, they got more than they wanted. So it actually started with Reagan and then continued. And Trump just was like, who he is, he doesn't apologize for being a racist. So he just said, and now I'm just like, well, I can come out the closet too. So you had a lot of people coming out and saying things and co-signing on him um, and so that's that's what he has contributed to it. And I love what you said about people say this is not who we are. Oh, it has always been who America has been. You try to write anything about reparations, you'll see what America truly is about. Well, and to that point, to that point, Michelle, um, and I agree with both of you. You know, is it helpful in our newsrooms? And, and Janae, I know we have you for just a few more minutes, and so I want to ask you a question before before we, we have to let you go, you know, does it help in terms of reporting that, you know, in order to fix a problem, you gotta know that the problem exists. If the problem had been masked, and, I, and not to say that, you know, especially black people didn't know that the problem existed, but now that, you know, it's uprooting itself, right? Because someone gave it permission to uproot. Does that, how does that change maybe the way you cover it now? Because it's so bold. Okay. In and if you have a if you have a second question, let me know because then I'll just answer them both before I head out and okay, talk, yes. toss it to Michelle for the rest of the hour. Okay. So my second question, um, my second question, Janae, is about how are black vo- how can black voices elevate these stories that like the beautiful resistance, the stories that need to be told if they get pushed back in their newsroom? Okay, so the first question, I think when you look at American history. There always has, first of all, black folks, people of color, disenfranchised people have always been wrestling to keep their shoulders off the mat, always. Um, But every time we've had great change, it's preceded by catastrophe. So it's like uh, slavery, reconstruction, Jim Crow, civil rights movement, uh, crack era, and then, you know, kind of this I don't know, dormant, like play nice, politically correctness behaviors Mm -hmm. for a little while. Um, Obama, and one thing I wanna say, we focus a lot on 45, but really Obama was the beginning of the unmasking because Mm -hmm. once that black man took office and it was real, white people got mad. White people who said they won't mad got mad Mm -hmm. and that's really for a lot of journalists even though black journalists had always gotten hate mail for their for as long as there have been black journalists they've gotten hate mail but I would say for like the last 20 30 years it was Obama that amplified the hate mail like I had always had hate hate mail but once that man got an office it was like I want to kill you now you are ruining it you and Obama you it was just like this extra layer of anger and indignance. Mm -hmm. And I think Obama is what led to Trump because it was like, oh no, y'all are 
black man in our White House, we we go in the extreme other direction and make America great and and racist again. A even true backlash. Are, yes. So yeah. that was the backlash, and what Trump represented was so <laughs> catastrophic and so true to Americans' origin story mm-hmm. that it required where we're at now, which mm-hmm. is new reconstruction, or the you know the very baby steps of new reconstruction. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Yeah, it was, unfortunately, America keeps on Americaning. <laughs> so we keep going through this cycle of we require great catastrophe to act right. So, I mean, hopefully we stay on the path of reconstruction and building and we don't have to fall back into to this cycle, but it is something about, it's a cycle. It's a cycle. So I, I, it was necessary for us to go through this because for some reason, American psychology requires it when you look at like the whole timeline. For your second question, before I have to leave you lovely people is, um, when you're experiencing pushback and you will, I'm sure Michelle, even as a columnist has, I have even as a column, like the, the pushback is real. Like there are people who are always gonna be a little fresh. Like I said, they're like, can you write a little less about that? Or, you know, maybe you don't need to write about it every time or blah, blah, blah. Like there's always gonna be some of that. Part of it is um, trusting yourself. Mm -hmm. And I know everybody, I'm always careful about how I answer this question because I get asked this a lot because not everybody feels like they have job security or safety enough. A lot of reporters who don't feel safe enough in their position or or comfortable or they're still grappling with imposter syndrome they come to me because i'm the loud mouth in a newsroom so i've had people come to me like this thing happened can you say something Mm -hmm. and i do because i feel like it's my duty because i'm a person who already speaks out about these things so it's like some of it is power in numbers Mm -hmm. if you feel like you can't do it go to someone in the newsroom who you think can build Mm -hmm. a collective be in community with the other you know good troublemakers Mm -hmm. um but also get in the practice of doing what you would do journalistically like doing the reportage to support your pushback like this is why we need this this is what our readership looks like talk talk journalism stats to them because we all know they respond to that like yeah. subscribers look like this don't you want to reach this community look what mm-hmm. happened the last time I wrote this so part of it is also doing the journalism mm-hmm. um but I really say like stay steadfast and um and know who your allies are and your comrades are and just keep pushing I mean I even as an intern I was kind of a loud mouth I, I don't <laughs> I'm sometimes like real grateful I'm still here. Um, We are so grateful, Janae, and grateful for your boldness. And I want to say that for your boldness and your courage and in every newsroom and every opportunity because it keeps pushing the envelope and opening the door. So thank you just for being you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Kristen. And thank you, Michelle. I have to have another panel to go to, but this has been such a fruitful conversation. And I just always love being in the company of badass brilliant black women so happy thank you so you. much janae yeah. thank you say goodbye to peppermint patty <laughs> <laughs> so michelle i i, I want to extend that question to you as well about when you get pushed back when a you know when a journalist gets pushed back in their newsroom and how to handle that i thought what janae said was excellent about no, i think you, you know, she made some power yeah, definitely so a couple things, I think that's just make sure that we you hear that you need a network of supporters. You need to find someone in the newsroom who has a higher up position who can be your champion. I was very fortunate to have some champions in the post newsroom so that when people would say stuff, they would like, no, that ain't gonna happen, you ain't doing it to her. Or, you know, they had your back, um, but they have to be high enough that the higher ups will listen to them and cultivate that. You know, we like to say mentors, but I'm just really meaning that you got to have somebody, you got to have a peaches in your note. You know peaches, your cousin peaches. Like, <laughs> she might not like you all the time, but if you came to her and said somebody was messing with you, she's like, let's go, let's go, let's go. She's going to go get them. Yeah. Yeah. They gonna, she going to go get them. So you need a peaches in your corner in the newsroom and cultivate that. And that's the person you go to when you're having a lot of trouble. 
last one. Um, secondly, you often can outlast the people who are giving you the most trouble. I got the best piece of advice from a, a reporter when I worked for the Evening Sun. Um, and he said, when you're having a lot of trouble with an editor or someone, just wait them out if you can. Because usually bad editors and people who are crazy move on. But if that doesn't happen, then you have to move on. You have to transfer, find an editor who um, appreciates your talent and then move on. Um, and, and, I, and I really do mean that. I mean, I, you know, the la a couple years before, like this last year was a pretty stolen year for me. Before that, I was very unhappy um, and thinking about leaving um, and very feeling very unappreciated. And then I got the most marvelous editor who totally got me. But I was waiting it out, right? I was there, and I, you know, I didn't leave because I'm like, you know, I'm not letting people push me out my job before I'm ready. Um, and that's what you have to say. And I think lastly, you have to have something else besides your career. This, you have to have a higher power, whatever that is for you. I'm a woman of faith. Yeah, and so yeah. you have to say, this is not all who I am. It is just can't. So you need to be active in your community. You need to have a passion outside your job so that when stuff happens on your job, you don't lose your mind um, and, and quit before you're ready to quit. Um, so, you know, if it's your family, whatever it is, you can't make your career the center of your life because nobody in their job, not your readers, not your stats, not your clicks, none of them are going to be there when you need things the most, somebody the most. And I think that, I mean, I've been at the Post for, like I said, almost 30 years. That's, that's, I wanted a few Black people to have hung around that long. And I did that because, you know what, I don't give a freaking thing about the post most of the time because I have a great husband, I have kids, I'm very active in my church, I started a financial ministry at my church, we volunteer in prisons, so I have so much going on for me that has nothing to do with the post, my self-worth is not tied up in being a nationally syndicated column with the Washington Post. In fact, if I'm in a room with you and we're, you know, and you know, like if when we could do little parties and you ask me who I was, I would probably tell you more about the stuff I do at my church or my husband or my kids before I ever mentioned to you that I work for the Washington Post. You probably never would know that unless you already knew that. You are such a whole person, Michelle. I, we haven't gotten into, we, we got a few minutes left and we haven't gotten into your grandmother because I love your backstory. You know, and, but some part of that into what you just said is having a strong why, right? Having a strong why, you have that anchoring story of your grandmother. The fact that you started that personal uh, finance column at your, at your church, First Baptist of Glen Arden. I'm getting That's ready to right. fangirl. I'm getting ready to fangirl. I can just tell your whole bio, Michelle. I'm getting ready to fangirl. That's right. But, um, That's but right. I think, but I think it's so anchoring. It's so anchoring in in why you would stay if even if you were getting pushed back because you have this this you have a whole life. It's not your existence. It's right. you know there is more to you and and your why expands beyond what you do, but it, all, but it also informs and plays right. into what you do. And so with that, we do have, we do have this, with this question, what, what issues and stories in the Black community do you think should be getting more coverage, Michelle? You know, um, all of them. I mean, I, you know, I don't even know where to start. You know, we still have issues with housing. We still have issues with healthcare. We still have lots of issues with education. Um, college. I think someone asked about um, loan forgiveness in, in the chat. They were asking yeah. about what did I think about that. Um, you know, I, I'm of two minds with that. I think there should be some loan, for, uh, loan forgiveness, but I think it should be targeted. Not mean tested necessarily, but I think there are lots of African Americans and minorities who have a debt and no degree. Or they went to a for-profit college and it was not, I mean, you might as well have my five-year-old, you know, five-year-old teach you, you know. Um, uh, and so for those folks, you know, having loan forgiveness will free them up to be able to free up their budget to do some things that help elevate them. 
but there are a lot of people who uh, may be quote unquote struggling, but you really do have the money to pay off that student loan debt. I mean, I, you know, let's talk about this. Not like that money disappears. Somebody got to pay that bill. That somebody is the American people. So I think that if we're going to be smart about it, we're going to target it to the people who need it the most. And often, most majority of them are going to be um, minorities, blacks, and 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 Latinos. Um, because they they often uh, have more debt. And why do they have more debt? Because they don't have as much family wealth. Why do they have much more family wealth? Because of slavery, Jim Crow, uh, you know, all of that stuff. It, uh, it's systemic still, racism, yes. It's systemic racism. And we need to beat that drum until we can't beat it no more. Uh, we have to stop apologizing and not writing about slavery, systemic racism. Um, so really almost every single beat has something to do with us. And that's actually how I, I mean, I used to cover religion. Uh, and uh, what, that, one of the reasons why I end up in the business section at the Evening Sun, because I approach my religion beat um, like that it encompasses everything. Like if you said, if you sneeze and said, bless you, I figured that was all my beat. <laughs> And because I expanded it so much to include economic development, that's how I got into the business thing. Uh, so whatever your beat is, find something on it that has something to do with Black folks and minorities or the disenfranchised, because every single beat has it on it. Well, and you know what, Michelle, I think that goes into, into the simple fact that Black history is American history. Right, right. Black okay. history is American history. And for us to even... You know, yes, we are a segment of the population, but we are the population. That's right. That's you right. know, and so yeah. kind of picking us apart as though like we can only talk about these things or only these things apply. Right. It's like, no, we are right. the population. That's right. So whatever yes. you're covering, healthcare, uh, government politics, uh, zoning, you know, you can you can carve out something to talk about race and what's happening um, and set yourself apart. You know, own it, own everything, like everything about your beat, um, and find something about it, uh, and you, and and that will definitely set you apart. We have four more minutes, Michelle. I think I've answered the question, but before we go, you talked about a new book that you're working on, and yeah. I think the people want to know. I think they would want to know about this book. Oh, How are you I'm helping us? I'm so excited about this book. I wrote it so quickly. I'm just like freaking out how long it took me to write it because they wanted to get it out as soon as possible. So it was a fast track book uh, and it's coming out in May. So if you're on this call, I would love if you pre-ordered it. That would definitely help me because pre-orders people, I mean, I'm learning more about, you know, uh, book selling, but pre-orders make a huge difference to the publisher. And the more I pre-orders I can get, especially as an African American, then they they will buy more books from some of you who might want to write a book. Because if my book does well, they're like, oh, okay. And then they will uh, do contracts for other African Americans. So it's called What to Do with Your Money When a Crisis Hits. And if you just Google me and my name, it'll come up, and you can pre-order it on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or Apple or Google, all those platforms. You can pre-order it; it'll come to you in May. It's it's um it's like a FAQ, so it's an easy easy read. You can skip around, but it talks about what do you do if you lost your job? You know what do you how if you made it you made it out right or you made it out and up? How do you make sure that you don't overspend on your children? Um, what happens when you know relatives call and ask you for a loan? What should you do? Uh, when should you give money? Um, it just covers so much. Um, not in an encyclopedia kind of way. I mean, it is, it's more like this kind of form, right? People have been asking questions and we've been giving them answers. And obviously we can only go but so deep, but that's sort of how the book, the book is sort of such is like, let's talk this, talk about this a little bit, but I'm going to give you a lot of resources where you can go to find more information. And give us the name one more time, Michelle. So what to do with your money when a crisis hits, a survival guide is the subtitle. Ooh, um, we need this. Yeah, it's a, and it's very, it's, a, it's like a pot. It's really easy. It's the kind of book you can, whether you're really good with your money or you just starting out, um, I think it will be very, very helpful. Fantastic. What to do when crisis hits? What to do with your money when a crisis hit? When what crisis to do with hit. your money when a crisis hit? This is a survival guide. And you guys heard, Michelle, we want to pre-order this book. 
so that it helps her and ultimately helps black booksellers, black That's authors. Exactly right. Um, That's exactly right. Which is phenomenal. Michelle, I know people can Google you, but before we go, can you tell them how they can find you on social media? So um, I hang out mostly on Twitter because um, I just love it as short, as easy. I don't got all this stuff going around. <laughs> um, so it's uh, at Singletary M. So follow me. I'll follow you right back. Um, so mostly you can reach me on Twitter. I'm also on Facebook and Instagram, but mostly I'm on Twitter. You can always email me at the post. Um, all our bylines are hyperlinked. It comes right into my email box. Um, there's an author's page at the Washington Post. You can learn about all the columns that I'm writing about personal finance. Um, so those are the, the, the best ways um, to uh, get a hold of me. Fantastic. Um, I'll give out my contact information. I am on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook at Kristen, K-R-I-S-T-E-N-L-P-O-P-E-T-V. Michelle, this has been more than a pleasure. Yeah, it's been great. This has been more than a pleasure. Thank you for all of this that you have given us. It has truly been a gift to have this conversation with you. Like I said, I was fangirling leading up to this, oh, even okay. more so now. You have been such a gift to us for years. Um, and I love that you bring your whole self, that yeah, you always sure. bring your full and your whole self to the table to have conversations. So I appreciate you. You're welcome. Well, thank you all for having me. Thank of all of you who took your evening to listen. I really appreciate it. And uh, if you've got any career questions, you certainly can email me. I might not be as Tommy because it's crazy right now. It's about to be tax season, y'all. But I will try to definitely get back to you, I promise. <laughs> That's real. Thank you so much, Michelle. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.